The time has come and Kerbal Space Program 2 is finally out. I mean finally, it's not like we've been waiting for so long. So long. But it's here now, so we can finally bask in the glory of all the new content. You know about the roadmap, right? The roadmap? Yeah, sure, I, I know about the roadmap. Yes, as you all probably know, KSP2 has been released in early access, meaning that a lot of the content is missing right now. But I thought it would still be nice to jump in and look at all of the new parts. So without further ado... First up, we have a new command pod called the Cockatoo. And what I like about this one is that it has sort of a modernized look to it, kind of like a crew dragon. It is in the size category large, and it is capable of carrying up to 5 kerbals. As you can see, the Cockatoo has monopropellant and RCS thrusters, but like the other command pods, it doesn't have any forward or aft control. As a small side note, I just want to point out that if you look at some of the gameplay videos that was recorded a couple of weeks before the release of KSP2, you will see that there are differences in, for example, the Cockatoo's mass from that build to the early access build. A lot of the other parts have had small changes as well. And I think it shows that the game is constantly being tinkered with. Up next, we have the Wanderer. This lander has four seats and is also in the large category. It also carries monopropellant but have no RCS thrusters. The developers must have thought that KSP-1 lacked bigger control vessels, because we have also gotten two new probe calls. First one is the large HL-02. And then we have the Extra Large XL01. The final new control vessel that is in KSP2 is the new rover buddy called the Bulldog. This part is the first of its kind, since it is the first command part that is designed with heavy rovers in mind. It can carry up to three kerbals. With the Bulldog comes a new structural piece called the Rottweiler, which is supposed to help ease the building of a functional rover. Evidently, uh, the Rottweiler's use case isn't clear to me. Although it isn't a command vessel, the Wayfarer can still carry up to eight kerbals. It is in the large category, which means that it is both wider and taller than the hitchhiker. This also means that two hitchhikers stacked on top of each other can still carry eight kerbals while being only a little bit longer, much less wider and most importantly one and a half tons lighter than the Wayfarer. KSP2 introduces three new engines. The first one is the large engine, the Lapadoodle. The Labadoodle is supposed to be the big brother of the Terrier and the Poodle, hence its name. Of all the Mathalox engines, this one has the best ISP in vacuum at 343 seconds, narrowly beating the Poodle. However, the Poodle is no match when it comes to thrust in vacuum, as the Labadoodle produces more than three times the amount. The second new engine is the Mammoth 2. It replaces the Mammoth 1 from KSP-1. The new engine is a slight upgrade when it comes to thrust. And at the moment it is the most powerful engine in KSP-2. The third and final engine is the new large nuclear engine called the Super Warm Engine for Rocket Vehicles or Swerve for short. Disregarding the iron thrusters, the Swerve has the best ISP in vacuum. 
It also produces a bit more thrust than the before mentioned Lapidoodle, however weighing in at almost double as much. Another thing to note when it comes to nuclear engines in KSP-2 is that they use hydrogen as fuel. KSP-2 therefore introduces a lot of new fuel tanks storing hydrogen as fuel. There's only one small hydrogen tank located at the top of my hydrogen tank tower. However, for medium, large and extra large, there is a short and a long fuel tank for each size. And then there's this giant ball, which has its own size category. Two times X, I guess double XL or something like that. And then no name. However, it can store up to 50 tons of hydrogen. So it's a big boy. Speaking of big balls, we also got a new fuel tank storing monopropellant. This giant radial mounted monopropellant tank is called the Embiggent, and it is in the extra large category. Given that this is radial mounted and extra large, it is, for me at least, difficult to see a good use case for it in this current version of the game. Maybe as an aesthetic piece? Moving swiftly on, we have the new structural parts, and a lot of these are trusses. And to really showcase the size of these, we start off at the ceiling of the VAB. These are the truss junctions. Next up, we have the simple truss sections, consisting of a short and a long piece for each size. Even though four parts are in the extra small category, they are still different in size, so I guess the developers need to add an extra extra small category. For the most part, each truss section has a squared and a rounded variant of the same size. Then we have the adapters going from rounded to squared, and then we have the resizes going from a smaller or larger size to the next one. Besides all the trusses, we also get some new tubes. These tubes can be modified lengthwise, however, they don't necessarily line up with a different size as you can see. We find a tube in each size category. We also get a special kind of truss in the payload category. These trusses come in medium, large and extra large. They come in a short and long variant. One of the ways these can be used is as a way to have smaller parts in between a bigger sized rocket. In the payload category, we also get new cargo bays. They come in a small, medium, large and extra large size. Every size have a short and a long variant. They all also have a nose cone part, except the small size. These cargo bays are also the first type of cargo bays that fit rockets instead of space planes. This gives us new possibilities in creating rockets with payloads that are reusable. As I mentioned earlier in the video, the mass of each part still seems to be a work in progress, which especially becomes clear when you compare the mass of similar parts. For example, if you look at another new part, the extra large nose cone. This part weighs 800 kilos, while the extra large cargo nose only weighs 250 kilos. You could argue that the extra large cargo nose is hollow and therefore should weigh less. However, the large cargo nose weighs 625 kilos, only a little less than the new nose cone and way more than the extra large cargo nose cone. I'm sure these figures will soon look a lot different. In KSP2 we have lost the fairing and the heat shield from KSP1 that have the weird in between size of 1.875 meters. Instead we have these two new parts, the extra small fairing and the extra large heat shield. In general, it seems like the weird size of 1.875 meters have been removed from the game, at least for now. 
As most of you probably know, one of the big new features in CASP2 is the procedurally generated wing parts. They are grouped in three different part types, wings, stabilizers and control surfaces. They come in small, medium and large, as well as extra small for stabilizers. Speaking of control and stability, we also have a new large reaction wheel. The next new part is perfect if we have something radial mounted onto our rocket that is extra large and unwanted because we can now decouple it with the new extra large radial decoupler. As you have probably noticed by now, a lot of the new parts are either large or extra large. This gives us the possibilities to build bigger than before. These two new docking ports, one being large and the other extra large, will therefore surely come in handy when docking giant interplanetary and later on interstellar rockets. Up next we have two new batteries, again one large and one extra large. The large battery can store up to 10,000 units, while the extra large can store up to 20,000 units of electrical charge. The biggest battery in KSP-1 could only store one-fifth of that. Bigger batteries demand better ways to generate electrical charge, or EC for short. Therefore there are two new generators and one new solar panel in KSP-2. The first generator is the KR4-P3, which uses uranium to generate up to 50,000 units of EC per second, which is a ridiculously high amount. Remember that the biggest battery stores 20,000 units. When active, the generator uses 0.003 ton of uranium per hour, meaning that it can run at 100% for 333.33 hours per one ton of uranium. That would generate a total of 60 billion units of EC. Did somebody say interstellar travel? The second generator is the RTG500, a radioisotope thermoelectric generator which produces only 10,830 units of EC per second. This generator is always active and can run for around 108 and a half years, generating a rough total of 100 billion units of EC. Last up, we have the new solar panel called the Colossus, and you might think that it would lack in how much EC it can generate given that it won't stop working like the generators. However, it has an output of 35,000 units of EC per second. It can, of course, only work in sunlight. We also get two new parts in the ground category, one landing leg and one wheel. The new landing leg, called Wallaby, is the first large landing leg in KSP, being almost three times as big as the medium-sized Wombat from KSP-1. The new wheel doesn't follow this size trend as it is only medium sized. However, this seems to make sense given that we already had a large rover wheel in KSP-1. One can hope that with all the new big parts, those large rover wheels might actually become useful. As a small side note, I just quickly wanted to show that this small sized wheel the Rover Max M1 is in KSP2, since it wasn't in the build that was showed a few weeks before release. I see this as another confirmation that the developers are working hard on getting KSP1 parts ready for KSP2. So don't fret if your favorite part from KSP1 hasn't made it yet. With the new larger landing legs, KSP2 would lack longer ladders, but luckily let's look at the new large ladder. This new ladder, called Bobus, extends just enough so that it reaches close to the ground when combined with the new Wallaby. We now only have one new part left, and I have of course, as one should, saved the very best part for the end. 
I hope you are sitting down and are ready to get your mind blown, or at least your eyes blinded, because here we go. Yes, we finally got a new light, the part we have all been yearning for. I mean, did you see that light show? Not only is it a brand new light, it is also the smallest light. Okay, I know this is not a new exciting part, but given the shaky release of KSP2, I hope we at least all can see this part as a sign that the future for KSP2 is bright. I hope you all enjoyed this overview of all the new parts, and if you feel like it, please like and subscribe, and I promise I'll try my very best to make great videos. Ta-ra!